Hello, it's Duncan. We call the objects that are accessed by a test, the ones that we create at the beginning and discard at the end, its fixture. In this episode, I'm going to show an interesting new way to use fixtures in JUnit with Kotlin. I've arranged the windows here so that you can see the contract on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we have two implementations of that contract, the fake value of tests and the fake value of through HTTP tests. And under here, there's the value of tests, the one that actually talked to their test server. And as two of those tests would normally be disabled, I've created another run configuration, this really all in gilded rows test that sets the system properties that are required to make sure that we run all three sets of contracts every time. So let's just run those tests and check they work. That's good. Now the gist of my idea for handling fixtures in Kotlin is to separate the fixtures from the state of the test. So at the moment our fixture is this URI and this handler, and they are fields of our test, in this case our contract. What I want to do is not make them fields, I want to separate them out into their own object. What would they look like? Well, it's a data class, I suppose. We'll call it fixture, and it will have the properties of our test class. Now what we want to do is to make our value of contract take a fixture rather than these properties. And we're going to do that first of all by making it take both. So we'll add val fixture in here, and that's not the one we want. We want the value of contract fixture. Now these we can resolve in terms of the fixture. This is the fixture handler. Now the places we called this from will be broken, but we can fix that just by calling the constructor around those parameters. That's one. That's another. And that's the last one. So let's try running that, see whether it does the same thing. Well, we haven't changed the behavior, that's good. Now we can take these two properties, take them out of the constructor and put them into here in the body, and then we can inline them. That one's gone, and that one's gone. So now everywhere we're talking to properties of the test, we're now talking to properties of the fixture. The fixture is itself a property of the test, but we've only got one object now. Where are we doing that? Well, we're doing here, fixture handler, fixture handler, fixture handler, and so on. Just check that does do the same thing by running the tests. Wonderful. Now though, there's this client, which is also part of the fixture of our contract. It's just derived from this fixture class we're bringing in now. So what we can do is we can put that into here, derive it in there. This is now directly from our properties. And we can fix up the test around us by saying we have client equals fixture client. And then again, inlining that. Run that. So now all of our test state all of this fixture is encapsulated into a single object. It was encapsulated as fields of our contract, of our test, but now we've pulled that out as a separate concern. It's a little bit of a pain to keep on saying fixture client and so on. It's okay here, but in here, for example, we're doing fixture URI, fixture handler, fixture, and so on. We can solve that problem with a with. So with makes the fixture the receiver, and that now means that none of these fixture dots are required. So we could take out all of those in one go and run just to check that we're right. Brilliant. Now, I hope you're asking, why are we doing this? Where is this going? What's the advantage? Well, the answer is that now fixture is a data class and we are responsible for creating it rather than the test class, which JUnit is responsible for creating. How does that help? Well, let's go over here into our fake value of tests. Here we can pull, for example, this fixture out into a field. And we'll call this base fixture. Once we've got a base fixture, we can manipulate it. So for example, this thing could be base fixture, copy, changing the handler. And that means now that this URI is specified in only one place, and we can inline it. 
check we were right by running the tests. Wunderbar. For symmetry, we should probably do the same thing here. So we'll take our base fixture and copy it, giving it a handler of the roots. And then our base one, which we don't expect to use, we could set up a root that just returned a response that we'll know when we see. Now that would allow us to inline this roots and check that it works. Good. What's happening in the value of tests? Well, they've got their plain old fixture and no dependencies on the fake value of tests. Now, when we find that the value of test server gives us a different value for banana, so bananas are now seven pounds, we can put that into the fixture. Use it in here and set it up in our base fixture here. Remember, that's nullable in case 609 isn't a valid price. And in here, we can use the actual values we're getting for a value of now. Run that. And we're back in action. Again, because we're the people who create this fixture, we can now use properties from the fixture in the rest of our test. So we can use that in here and run that. Now, once again, we're left with this fixture and fixture. And once again, we can solve that problem with a width. And let's for symmetry do it for all of our tests. And run that. And in fact, we can go further and take all of this test data and put it on fixture. And now in here, we had the symmetry of base fixture. And maybe rename that to be a found item. And run that. Missed one little comma. Now all of our data is associated with the fixture. There's just this irritating with fixture bit here. Now there's a solution to that problem and it involves creating a parameter here with the fixture. And it looks like we don't need that after all. If we were to run this, we found we can't because we don't have anything set up to resolve this parameter. Tune gives us a clue though. It says you should have a parameter resolver. How do we go about doing that? Well, we can create ourselves a parameter resolver, which is a parameter resolver. What will one of those look like? Well, we need to implement some methods. And in here, I'm just going to say, yes, we do support whatever parameter you're asking. And these are almost certainly not really nullable. Resolve parameter. wants us to return the value for whatever it is we're missing. That is to say the fixture here. So how can we get a value of the fixture? Well, we can look in the extension context, I think. And here we've got required test instance. That will be the instance of our J unit test. Now we could use reflection on that to go and get this property, the fixture. But a sweeter way of doing it is to implement an interface. We can define that interface in here. We can say, we have an interface and to be a fixture source means that you have a val called fixture that returns anything really. If that's the case. Then we could take this thing as a fixture source. And if it is, then we could get the fixture on it. And if it isn't, then the test is not a fixture source. And we want to return that link. Okay, so now we just need to make this thing a fixture source. 
which means that this is an override. And finally, we need to use our fixture resolver in our tests. And that's an extend with passing it our fixture resolver as a class. Let's see whether this madness works. And it actually does. And you can see here that this fixture is now the parameter rather than the property here. We can make the same thing true for all the other tests. That in there, and that in there, and now run. Now we would seem to be quite a bit worse off now. This is a lot more complicated. But I have one more trick on my sleeve. And that is that if these were extension functions, then they would be called the same way in the Java virtual machine. That is to say that if this was actually fixture dot returns price, then the fixture will be passed as the first parameter. And that's what Jane is going to do with it for us. So it means we can take this out. Now that means that this fixture here is resolving back to our property, but because this is an extension function method hybrid, this inside here is both the test class and our fixture class. So we can remove this all together. Let's try, shall we? There we go. So again, now we can take this and put it here and get rid of that. And the last one. And run. And everything passes. So what have we done here? Well, we've made our test state, our fixture, a lot easier to deal with because we now own its lifecycle. We can create one anytime we want rather than waiting for JUnit to create a test for us. That means that we can make them into data classes, we can copy them, we could even mutate them if we wanted to. Ordinarily, that would make it harder to get at the individual items in a fixture. We'd have to prefix everything. But by making these extension methods as methods, and finding a way to populate them from a property, we've regained direct access to all the fields of our fixture type. And those of you who are up to date with the latest Kotlin developments will, I'm sure, see how this will extend to context receivers. Do I think you should go out and cast all your tests like this, especially with a bodged together fixture resolver? Uh, no, I don't. But I hope this has shed some light on the relationship between tests and their fixture maybe increase your ambition in this area but if not you'll be pleased to hear that in the next episode we'll be stepping away from testing and back to implementing real value for our customers if you'd like to see that episode then please subscribe to the channel and if you've enjoyed this then i think you'll enjoy the book that i wrote in that price called java to kotlin a refactoring guidebook details of which are in the show notes below thanks for watching